Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner with Coronavirus Update number 97. Today we'll talk about Managing Pandemics Part 2, a follow-up for last week, a safe holiday for Grandma, and will the Pfizer and Merck pills end the pandemic? And so if we're going to talk about managing the pandemic, I suppose we might as well just start with mismanaging the pandemic. Um, so unfortunately, you don't have to go very far. We know, uh, hopefully you've, been following, you've probably seen the headlines about how bad things are in Russia and Eastern and Northern Europe, but uh, things are kind of getting bad here in Nebraska again as well. So if you look at uh, this, which should have been anticipated, we saw the numbers going up, uh, at least in Lincoln and, uh, and uh, Douglas County, because we have good dashboards. The state had taken their dashboard down, so it was harder to see this coming. Uh, but we know hospitalizations follow uh, case rates by two to three weeks, and of course that's exactly what's happened. So uh, here in Nebraska, we're up to uh, 467 hospitalizations right now. That's the most we've had since January 10th of 2021, uh, with the numbers still heading up. Uh, and more of the local level, the Douglas County view shows, of course, not only coronavirus hospitalizations, which took a big jump uh, here this last week, but also total hospitalizations. And this is becoming more and more of a problem uh, because it's not just coronavirus we're taking care of. We have to take care of everything else. And there's that huge backlog we've talked about in the past. And this prolonged surge is becoming a problem. Uh, uh, someone was asking me lately about whether I thought her mom's surgery might be delayed in a couple weeks. And the answer is yes, it might. Uh, what's, quote, critical versus not versus elective? Well, it kind of depends. It's a relative of terms. So we're at the point now where we'll have to start delaying again, for example, maybe near displacements. Uh, but how what things can be delayed? Can the, can the hysterectomy be delayed? A gallbladder replacement? What about a cancer biopsy? Uh, and this gets to the point where coronavirus, because of the hospital capacity issue, starts affecting the death rate for everything else too. So the death for everything start going up when your hospitals start hitting capacity. So this isn't just a coronavirus problem in Nebraska. Here in Lincoln, uh, same problem, we're up to 107 hospitalizations total, with 68 being county residents and uh, 39 from being outside of Lincoln. Uh, so both Lincoln and Omaha take care of not just themselves, but the rest of the state. Uh, Brian does a pretty good job of showing this you know, geographic spread. So yes, a lot of uh, those patients are from here in Lincoln, Lancaster County, but a lot of those patients from all over as well. Again, showing the difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated. And so there's a very big difference, a uh, lot more vac unvaccinated in the hospital than vaccinated. And of the people who are vaccinated in the hospital, they're mostly the elderly who probably should have gotten their third shot, but didn't or had a uh, commu uh, health condition that made them immunocompromised. Uh, the other thing you have to keep in mind is this pool of patients is pretty small. So here in Lincoln, uh, uh, around 85 to 90 percent of people in this very age range are vaccinated. Uh, so, despite that small popul that those small numbers, the small population that's not vaccinated makes almost all up all of these people who are in the hospital and almost everybody that's in the ICU or on a ventilator. Uh, earlier this week, I was listening to music and I uh, heard the song again uh, from The Boxer by Simon and Garfunkel, and these words really stuck out to me. A man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest, and that's kind of the problem we're having with the pandemic. Uh, people want, are believing what they want to believe and really just ignoring the numbers. And the numbers are there, they've been there, uh, and the frustration from those, for those uh, of public health is we've actually known how to do this for decades. It just seems that all of our political leaders have forgotten how we've done this in the de in de for the past decades. Uh, so continuing on to last week, we talked about some other infectious diseases. Uh, and uh, I'll start with some misconceptions. Again, the problem we've had, the, this one, the, the Barrington folks thought that we could isolate the high risk. Unfortunately, we can't. We've, we, we knew that. Unfortunately, the, the ivory tower think tank people had, who hadn't done public health didn't know that. Uh, also, this, un, this, under, this un, think, or assertion that vaccinations are an individual decision. They aren't, and they never have been just an individual decision because we learned it didn't work when you tried it that way. Uh, so another good write-up. Uh, by uh, Caitlin Gentilina, your local epidemiologist, about the history of rubella, for example. And we made rubella vaccination universal for far less than what we made this decision of making coronavirus vaccination universal. And she puts together this nice chart comparing the two, rubella versus uh, the COVID delta, uh, which is turns out to be just as infectious as a rubella, if not more, more infectious, unlike the pre-Delta, which wasn't near as infectious as this one. That's why the numbers all, all should have changed uh, six months ago. Uh, and we did this to prevent not that many deaths at the time or that can occur right now, but there was a lot more deaths previous before we did a universal rubella vaccination. There was a high asymptomatic carriage rate among children, uh, but the risks uh, are, are not that different, honestly, at least from the kids' standpoint. However, we don't vaccinate all those children to protect the kids. We vaccinate all those children to protect the fetuses. Uh, and so if there was ever a pro-life vaccine, it's the rubella vaccine. 
Uh, and so she goes through the history a little bit. And I think this is uh, the other point that needs to be made is that we've tried this before. So uh, back in 1960, 64, 65, with a, a big surge in rubella, uh, we had over 11,000 fetuses that mi miscarried and uh, over 20,000 infected infants that were born, but uh, meant some who died, some were deaf, some were blind, some many had other permanent disabilities. Uh, and you'll note this, despite warnings to keep infected children away from pregnant women, you know, trying to just do non-pharmaceutical interventions alone, still nearly 50,000 pregnancies were impacted. So vaccines are a critical strategy to stop something like this. And so two theories were then put out. So, okay, we have a vaccine to make this go away. Let's try one of two things. We could vaccinate everybody, which is the general public health response, but some people wanted to do a more targeted. They only wanted to va vaccinate adolescent girls and women of childbearing age. Some countries picked door number one, others picked door number two, and guess what? This strategy did not work. So only vaccinating the people who want to or are at high risk and not vaccinating everybody else doesn't work for a pandemic uh, infection like this. You need to move to universal vaccination. So that's again why we need to have some type of a vaccine requirement. Uh, and because we've learned this over and over again, that just trying to do targeted vaccines for infections like this doesn't work at in the real life. Uh, and so that's why, for example, almost every uh, school requires kids to be vaccinated against measles, mumps, and rubella. We're not, we're not doing that to protect the children who are in school from rubella. We're doing that to protect the pregnancies of the people around them, their moms and or the school teachers who might be pregnant and who could, whose babies would be affected by rubella. So we're again, vaccinating the children not to protect them. We're vaccinating the children to protect other people. Uh, and this is just, it has to be a collective response and not an individual response, just like many of these other vaccine requirements. So this is not a new thing and we've learned it over and over again, although our current leader, political leadership seems to have failed, forgotten that at multiple levels. Uh, the other critical misconception from the Barrington folks was this COVID immunity is a one and done mentality, which it isn't. And that's that's the other problem. And so the reason bearing the two big reasons the Great Barrington vaccination uh, or declaration fails was because of two big misconceptions that people in public health. Well, one we already knew ahead of time that trying to isolate the high risk wasn't work. We, at the, early on, we didn't know that COVID immunity wouldn't be one and done. There are reinfections and they keep happening. So another perspective piece this week, uh, last past week from the New England Journal of Medicine is the future of SARS-CoV-2 vaccination lessons from influenza because using a, a measles strategy, which is what the, the Barrington folk, uh, folks were partly relying on, doesn't work because it doesn't act like measles. It acts more like influenza. And what, what happens with influenza, the reason why you have to get a flu shot every year is two problems. One, the immunity wanes over time, and then the antigenic drift, meaning the mutations in influenza are such that even if you have immunity, it might not work because it's a different uh, antigen you have to worry about now. So to learn to live with COVID, uh, we need to do appropriately manage it, and that's to understand and use the right model for it. And using a measles model is not gonna work for this. We have to use an influenza model, which means repeated vaccinations and boosters. Uh, and the other thing that keeps bugging me is people will say, well, we never closed schools for flu season. Actually, yes, we did. And there's met, you can don't take too many Google searches to have times where we had flu outbreaks in different communities where they did close schools because they had a lot of kids sick. And here's just one of many uh, articles uh, from 2019. People seem to have forgotten about that. There were times where even influenza got that bad. And so whether you do things like this, you should do based on the local rates and the number of sicknesses, which means some type of a dashboard. So thankfully our coronavirus dashboard for the state is back again. Rather than taking it away, why don't we keep it there, but also track the other viruses that cause recurring problems? Why don't we have a, a virus dashboard that tracks not just COVID, but also influenza and RSV, which also are problems year after year? And then we can learn how to manage these appropriately and have fewer deaths and hospitalizations for not just COVID, but many other diseases as well. Um, and so, you know, if you if you don't believe that coronavirus keeps capping back in, I think looking at the excess death slides. And so, again, uh, you can go right on the CDC website, and I put a link in the notes section. You can see what does a bad flu season look like? Well, that 1819 flu season from that headline, uh, these were those uh, back then. Here's coronavirus in comparison. You'll see there's no comparison. So we had the initial wave. Uh, we had people who thought, oh, this might be a seasonal virus, and we could remove all restrictions in the south back at last in the summer of 2020, and that had a big surge with that. Uh, then we people thought, well, maybe we hit, quote, natural herd immunity. We had the huge surge during the election at the end of last year. And then people thought, again, maybe we're at herd immunity. Then we have yet another huge surge. So we keep seem to be uh, missing this over and over again. Yes, there is some natural immunity, but it's not enough to start a surge. And you are not going to get to natural herd immunity because that's never happened before for an infection like this. Uh, there's a reason why all of our pandemics are stopped mostly through vaccination or some other public health response. And you can also look at it by state by state. So Florida, for example, you know, there's some ba a bad flu year there. They missed the first uh, 
because they locked down, but then they then their summer they had a lot last summer at the surge over the election season, and then they made they made an even bigger mistake. They started schools with no masks, did everything wrong, and their death rate this last surge was more than the other two. Uh, again, Mississippi, similar thing. They had an initial surge when it first showed up the summer, thinking it might be seasonal, the election year madness, and then yet another surge in Mississippi. And so the question is, are we going to get another one on the tail end? Uh, well, here in Nebraska, it looks like we're having a prolonged surge. So uh, the other frustration is I'll hear in the newspaper reports that can, uh, the, that the uh, virus is just spread, spreading despite highly vaccinated communities. We do not have any, quote, highly vaccinated areas in the, in the United States for the most part. Uh, highly vaccinated uh, with the old strain of coronavirus with an R naught in the two and a half to three and a half range, 60, 70 percent might have been enough to get there. But you really got to be probably 85, 90 percent at least to stop this coronavirus uh, pandemic from coming back again. So we do not have highly vaccinated in the, in the United States. Uh, now, Caitlin Jettelina in one of her other recent posts put this uh, uh, graphic together. Well, I think she's a nice explanation. The highly vaccinated, uh, you're going to have what this is, the, is the percent unvaccinated. So if 80% are vaccinated, that means 20% are not vaccinated. When you have, have anywhere uh, more than 20%, say 30, 40, 50%, guess what? You have these huge surges. And so this is why everything's breaking out in uh, Northern Europe and Eastern Europe. Yes, including the Ireland and the UK. They are not, quote, I would say, well, they're relatively higher, higher vaccinated these, but they're not, quote, highly vaccinated. Vaccinated. They also don't have anything in place like a green pass, for example, like Spain, Portugal, Italy are, are still, they're not relying on vaccination alone to control coronavirus. Uh, they are, you know, remember that uh, public health to work has to be multiple and uh, proved uh, multiple layers to be successful. And there's individual things you do, like choose to stay distance, for example, but there are shared responsibilities like getting vaccinated, for example. Uh, this is not solely individual decision making to control a pandemic. Uh, so we need something like a, like a green pass. I hope we'll get there at some point. Uh, I have no idea how long it'll take, but hopefully we have some leadership in, in, in Nebraska or in the nation to make this happen more broad, broadly. I did see that uh, in the Times Square, they're going to require this uh, for New Year's. Um, the other problem we're running into now that has is also concerned is our flu vaccination rates are not not what they used to be. Uh, there is some concern that this general COVID anti-vaccine anti sentiment is spilling over into general anti-vaccine sentiment. And the last thing we read right now is a big big rebound in flu cases by not having enough people vaccinated. These are the this is the progress so far with children being vaccinated, and this is the progress with pregnant women being vaccinated because pregnant women are at risk for influenza as well as COVID. So we need to make sure people are vaccinated for these as well because the last thing we need right now with our hospitals capacity overwhelmed is a flu pandemic to add, add um, to everything else. Uh, the last the next thing I want to talk about is, is protecting grandma. Just like flu shots, the best way to protect grandma is to get her grandkids vaccinated. So if you have five to 11 year olds or other young kids right now, this is the time to get them vaccinated. Plus anybody who's over 40, I'd also recommend they get get their their booster shot that's the best way to protect everybody that's what we're doing for thanksgiving the good news is for for my family everybody over 40 has a va has been va has had not just va two vaccines but had their burst booster and all the other people under 40 coming to our house they've had at least their first two shots so we don't have to worry quite as much although i'll take an added layer of precaution so for example i'm going to the state education conference the next couple of days where i'll be a lot around a lot of people and omaha has no mask requirement that puts me a little bit of risk i'm not worried about my own health I've, i'm 50 fit and he has my three shots, but I'll probably be wearing my mask around the high uh, uh, concentration areas of people. Uh, and also when I get back, I'll probably do a, a rapid test just to be on the safe side so I don't affect uh, my parents or my father-in-law or somebody like that. So you should still look at layers when you're trying to protect. So hopefully through family gatherings, you have people who refuse to get vaccinated. Well, you can do these rapid tests. They're done in 15 minutes. It's not, it's less complex, just as well. It's no more complicated than a pregnancy test it only takes 15 minutes and it's pretty easy to figure out. So I'd recommend this as an added layer of safety for your family if you're going to get together for Thanksgiving and Christmas and somebody doesn't want to be vaccinated or share their vaccine status. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is the, the new pills by Pfizer and Merck. And uh, Gottlieb, uh, well, he keeps getting quoted uh, over and over again, but I keep uh, point out one that he's on the board of Pfizer, so keep, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, these uh, pills do have a, a huge potential to decrease uh, mortality and deaths, and yes, they could help in ending the, the severity of the pandemic. They won't make the panic de pandemic go away. I mean, infections would still happen, but they would decrease the death rate substantially. Although there's some issues there, uh, one, first of all, these haven't been approved quite yet. So we're talking probably at least January before we get these pills. But actually, people said the same thing about info, about the vaccine, that, oh, it's over. Well, that having the pills only part of the story, just like vaccines don't help if they don't go from refrigerator to an arm. The pill doesn't help until somebody takes it appropriately. 
So there's a couple things that need to happen with the Pfizer and milk, uh, Pfizer and the Merck pills. One is people would need to get tested and know they have COVID, which is already a problem. And timing is important. You have to take it soon enough. You can't wait till you're in the hospital and then take the pill. So will people take it? And the last thing is who's going to pay for it? Uh, I've seen estimates of somewhere in the seven to eight hundred dollars per pill per course range right now. That's expensive. So if 50 million people just say, hey, I don't want to get the, the vaccine, which is available free. I want the pill instead. 50 million times seven hundred dollars. That's thirty five billion dollars. So who's paying for this thing? So that's yet another issue. So anyway, uh, to summarize, you know, other thing people say, you know, how do I stay up to date? My two favorite sources right now are honestly your local epidemiologist. That gives you more of a public health. She does a great job of putting good summaries together. And the other uh, source I really like is uh, the, the TWIV update with Daniel Griffin. That's my Saturday morning mowing the lawn or now raking, uh, picking up leaves podcast where he does primary he does run through of all the latest clinical studies. So if you want to stay up to date, those are probably two good sources other than uh, these podcasts, for example. Uh, and lastly, of course, this is what I do for a living disclaimer. These are my opinions, not uh, those of uh, everybody I work with and for. Uh, but here's uh, my background so you know what I do and where I'm coming from.